Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Broderick Crawford in Henry F. Pringle's Theodore Roosevelt on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present a dramatization of the life story of one of America's most colorful and also, in a very real sense, one of her youngest presidents, Theodore Roosevelt. For this purpose, we have used a very fine biography by Henry F. Pringle, which won the Pulitzer Award. And we have sought to highlight something of the character and achievement of a great man who not only saw America as it was in his own time, but also had a vision of what destiny might have in store. Today, something of that destiny is on us. Theodore Roosevelt died 32 years ago, but then there never was a time when it was more fitting for Americans to remember him. To play such an important role, we have been lucky to get last year's Academy Award-winning actor, Broderick Crawford. And now, a word about Hallmark cards from Frank Goss before we begin the first act of the story of Theodore Roosevelt. There are Hallmark cards for every memorable occasion on your calendar, for birthdays, anniversaries, holidays... Yes, for every occasion that calls for remembrance, for a friendly greeting, a word of good cheer, an expression of sympathy, there is a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And that identifying Hallmark on the back, well, that says you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Henry F. Pringle's Theodore Roosevelt, starring Broderick Crawford. <laughs> At the end of the garden, the bayberry bush struggled and shook with some inner excitement. In a moment, a small freckled face burst forth and almost collided with another face, a much older one, notable for the large, straggly moustache and the intense blue eyes peering through rimless glasses. Well, hello. Do you need a hand out of that bush? <laughs> What's your name, son? Bobby. Well, what do you got there, Bobby? Oh, come on now. You're not frightened of me, are you? Mm-hmm. Not very neighborly, is it? I'm just the old fellow who lives in that big house up on the hill. I suppose we see what you got in your pocket there. Well, what do you know? The frog. Oh, no, I won't take him away from you. I used to catch frogs myself when I was your age. Didn't know that, did you? Uh-uh. I even kept them in my room. Oh, Mother raised Cain about it, said she couldn't have things hopping all over the place, so there was nothing for me to do but stuff them. Now, that makes us friends, doesn't it? Uh-huh. Good. Now, suppose we rest a while on this old log and have a look at that frog, huh? When was it? Fifty years ago? It has to be. But frogs and boys never change. Or sisters. Connie and Vicey always squealed and ran whenever I appeared with a new frog or some remarkable beetle or garden snake. Edith was different. Perhaps because she wasn't my sister. I think that's just the most wonderful mouse I've ever seen, Dee Dee. Well, there's nothing wonderful about it, except my... my taxidermy. That means stuffing. When I grow up, I'm going to be a naturalist and stuff lions and bears. Uh-huh. Let's see some more. Well, I've got a crow. You have? Can I hold it? No. My mother put it up there on the top shelf. You can see its tail, though. We can get it down, Dee Dee. You just lift me up. Well, I want to pet its feathers, Teddy. Lift me up. Oh, all right. Hi there, Teddy. I can't. You're too heavy. Teddy Roosevelt. Well, you are. I am not. You just can't lift anything. Everybody says you're a weakling. All right. I won't show you my crow. Go on back and play with the girl. I never want to see you again. She was right. 
I was a weakling, thin, sickly, and nervous. But in the next ten years, I did something about it. The punching bag. Riding. Boxing. I learned that only the strong are free. When the right time came, I was both. You can't be serious, Theodore. A young fellow of family, education, and position just doesn't go into politics. Why, the honest men get nowhere. Then it's high time they did, Tom. Honesty will always get nowhere until it starts somewhere. Dear Teddy, a long time ago, a very young gentleman told a very young lady that he never wanted to see her again. But he didn't forbid her to write her well wishes to our new assemblyman in Albany. Mr. Speaker! Mr. Speaker! Who is addressing the chair? Theodore Roosevelt from the 21st District. <laughs> it's the dude in the Park Avenue clothes. He wears gloves, so politics won't soil his hands. <laughs> that remark, sir, reminds me of the donkey that was jealous of the zebra for wearing stripes. Then one day the two animals swapped skins, but the change fooled no one, because you can always tell the donkey by his hee haw. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, there are no zebras in public life, but there are some who ought to be wearing stripes. Now, with your permission, I now submit a bill to end certain wrongs committed against the people of the state of New York. Mr. Roosevelt, you have my congratulations. For what, sir? For the speech you just made. And for reminding some of us here in Albany that the price of being a real American is to be a man without a price. Dear Edith, did I ever thank you for your letter? I have a very bad memory, and it has been five years. Now may I call on you in the next five days? The Aucklands are giving a party on Monday evening. put me down. Oh, no, not until you take it back. Oh, I do. I was terribly rude to you, and, and I was too heavy. All right, down you go. <laughs> Goodness. What will people think? Who cares? Come on, let's go out in the balcony. Theodore. Yes? Tell me about that ranch you bought out west. Oh, that's another world, Edith. You can really breathe out there, and the people are real. And the wildlife, where I've seen wolves, prairie dogs, wildcats, buffalo... When but... I grow up, I'm going to be a naturalist and stuff lions and bears. Oh, no, Edith. <laughs> I was only joking. You know, I've done a lot of looking around, a lot of thinking. I've got two ambitions. Yes? The United States must really be a united country, Edith. Out West people feel that they're the stepchildren of the East. We've got to be one family. We've got to be strong and respected by the whole world. But it's going to take a lot of work. Yes. But your second ambition. Well, uh... Edith, Maybe what do you say? Let me go back in. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Edith, remember those horrible stuffed frogs I used to show you and that ragged old crow you wanted to pet? I was thinking about them. When? Just now. Strange that we should both be, uh... I mean... Those were happy times, weren't they? Yeah, they were. You know, I've still got that collection of horrors in an old trunk... I thought that someday, if I have a boy, well, well, sons like that sort of thing. Some daughters might, too. Yes, if, if they were like you. Edith, you know my second ambition. It's mine, too, Theodore. were sons and daughters, five of them. They were fun, wonderful fun. If only I could have spent more hours with them. 
But there was so much to be done. Theodore, you can't be police commissioner of New York City 24 hours a day. It's almost midnight. Yes, dear, and lawbreakers work at night. Now, it's up to me to see that our police force keeps after them. No other police commissioner ever has? Exactly, Edie. Our patrolmen are lazy, inefficient, corrupt, simply because their superiors think too much of a night's sleep. Oh, there's no sleep for me either, knowing that you're prowling some dark street all alone. Oh, now, Edie, you're just tired. I'm just a woman worrying about her husband, Theodore. President McKinley gives you that appointment. We can go away for a vacation, can't we? If, Edie, if. Good night, dear. You there, officer. Wake up. Huh? I want the number of your badge. What for? What for? For sleeping on your beat. This is a dangerous neighborhood, and the law-abiding taxpayers have a right to the protection of the... Look, mister, run along before I fan you one. Try it, sir. Now on your feet. All right, you came looking for it. Hey, those teeth, the eyeglasses, I've seen them in the cartoons. It's Teddy. No, no. (laughs) Theodore. Edith. Oh, I had to find you. A telephone call came from Washington. You shouldn't have come out at this hour and in this district. And why not? It's high time our new assistant secretary of the Navy got a good night's sleep. The Navy. The symbol in steel and men of the United States. It was a weak and confused symbol, but it could be made strong. It had to be. America was no longer a second-rate power. The world had to learn that, especially Spain. Yes, and even Mr. Long, the Secretary of the Navy. Theodore, have you lost your mind? I don't believe so, Mr. Long. I think you have. I've just been told that you've been ordered huge amounts of ammunition without authorization and placed the entire fleet on war footing. I have, sir. I regard the sinking of the Maine as an act of war. Perhaps it is, but we can't be foolish. It's never foolish, sir, to be prepared. The day is coming... It's here now, when the Western Hemisphere must be free of European domination. Look at this map, sir. Here. Here is Cuba. A Spanish military stronghold menacing the whole east coast of Central America. There can never be an Isthmus Canal with but one entrance dominated by a European power. An Isthmus Canal. My dear boy, the French have spent 15 years, thousands of lives, and almost $300 million in the jungles of Panama. And still, there is no canal. There will be, sir. But it must be an American canal. The Pacific coast must grow and develop, and it can, only if American ships can reach it easily and cheaply. The Pacific must be defended, and it can if our warships have a shortcut. There will be a canal, Mr. Long. There must be. (laughs) Theodore, you have too many ideas for an assistant secretary of the Navy. I'm afraid you're right, sir. I'm resigning. What? Now, Theodore, we need you. At any moment, we may be at war. And when we are, sir, I'll be in Cuba. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Theodore Roosevelt, starring Broderick Crawford. It was the Greek poet Homer who first used the expression, winged words. In fact, the idea must have really caught his fancy because he repeated the phrase no less than 46 times in the Iliad and 58 times in the Odyssey. Unfortunately, most of us are not poets. We feel, but we find it difficult to put our feelings in words. Yet we are quick to recognize words that do express our meaning. And on seeing them, usually say to ourselves, why, that's it, that's it exactly. And this is exactly the remark you hear most often around the Hallmark display counters at stores everywhere. For the makers of Hallmark cards know that a greeting card must be of good design, must be in good taste, but above all, must say what you want to say in the way you want to say it. And Hallmark cards do just that. They give wings to your thoughts. That's why every day, more and more folks, when selecting a greeting card, look for the hallmark on the back. Next time, why don't you? It's certainly a comfortable feeling to know you can find a greeting card that truly expresses your thoughts while it reflects your good taste. And to know at the same time that when you send the card with hallmark on the back, your friends will know immediately you cared enough to send the very best. 
Now back to James Hilton in the second act of Theodore Roosevelt, starring Broderick Crawford. From the day that Theodore Roosevelt resigned as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, history took him for one of her own. Colonel Roosevelt, the Rough Rider, San Juan Hill, then peace and home again to another victory, the governorship of the state of New York. Two years later, history moved once more. At the second inaugural of William McKinley, Theodore Roosevelt took the oath of Vice President of the United States. The details are a little hazy for me now. Naturally, Edith and the children loved Washington. They thought it all very exciting. But they didn't have to preside over the Senate. Theodore. Yes, dear. Was it a hard day? You look tired. Oh, I'm exhausted. Edie, there's no greater punishment for me than to have to listen to 90 senators talk and talk and talk and never get a word in myself. <laughs> well, here, sit down. At least you can talk at me. Edie, are you happy here? If you are. Well, I'm not sure. There's so much to be done that isn't being done. We're a great nation now. We freed Cuba. We have the Philippines and a dozen islands scattered across the Pacific. We need that canal more than ever, and yet nothing happens. Too many people want to think the canal was speeches. Theodore. But... What? Please don't wave your glasses at me, dear. I'm not a Democrat. Yes, the vice president may have ideas, but there's little he can do about them. Only the president or Congress. And then, in a matter of a few terrible seconds, everything was changed. Mr. McKinney was speaking at the Temple of Music in Buffalo. I had lost a good friend, an America, a great man. We were a solemn and shaken group, the dead president's cabinet that gathered in a friend's house in Buffalo. The place had been shut up for the summer, and the furniture in the library was draped with dust sheets. But someone found a Bible. I placed my left hand on the open pages. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Bang! 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 <laughs> Ethel, what's going on here? Sheriff and bad men, Daddy. Kermit is playing you. Me? Uh-huh. When you were sheriff out west and captured the nine desperate outlaws. Uh, you're, you're sure I said nine? Why, yes, Daddy. Don't you remember? It was just the other night. You were telling us a bedtime story. I, uh, uh, I think it was only three outlaws, dear. I, I probably told you about them three times, and three times three makes nine, you see? Well, doesn't it? Yes, Daddy. All right, now suppose you run along and tell the boys to be quiet. I'm trying to write my first message to Congress. All right. Oh, Ethel. Yes, Daddy? Is specification spelled with two Fs? One F, Theodore. Huh? Oh, thank you, Edie. Ethel, your father is busy. Yes, Mother. Oh, spelling and mathematics, Edie. They give me more trouble than a delegation of congressmen. <laughs> How is your message coming, dear? Oh, bully, I'm right in the middle of recommending immediate reconstruction of the canal, and by George, I mean to see it through. I know you will, but right now... Another thing, there's got to be conservation of our natural resources. Theodore. Our forests are dying under the lumberman's axe. Yes, I say dear. that national parks are the only Theodore, answer to... Theodore, please. Huh? Oh, I was at it again, wasn't I? <laughs> you were. <laughs> I came to tell you, dear, that there are others waiting to hear your remarks. The newspaper men are in the red room. <laughs> The gentlemen of the press. Without them, many of my ideas might never have gotten across to the voters. I like them all, even those who disagreed with me, or rather those whose employers disagreed with me. Mr. Roosevelt, a lot of businessmen seem to be frightened of you. They're afraid the good old days are gone. We can't live in the past, gentlemen. We must build for the good new days ahead. Mr. Roosevelt, uh, what about the war between Russia and Japan? Well, I can't speak for publication, but here among us, let me say that Russia is not the friend of the United States. And whatever happens, Russia must not dominate China and the Orient. Uh, 
Gentlemen, you may print the fact that I've called the representatives of Russia and Japan to meet with me on the presidential yacht, the Mayflower. The outcome will be peace. Would you comment, sir, on the award to you of the Nobel Peace Prize? Well, I'm honored, naturally, but let me add, it's better to prevent a war than to end one. In the near future, I intend to propose that the nations of the world unite in an organization to settle injustices by reason rather than ruin. If reason will not prevail, then an international police force must. Hello, Theodore. Tom, why you won't... Well, come in, come in, come in. Yeah, it's been a long time, hasn't it? Yeah, I'm afraid to count up the years. Sit down, Tom. I'm just cleaning out my desk. It's moving day, you know. I know. Theodore, you should have run for another term in office. Oh, please, Tom. I've been through all of that before. What are your plans? I don't know. I'd, I'd like to spend some more time with my family, travel. I've had Africa on my mind most of my life. Africa? You see, when I grew up, I was going to be a naturalist. So the boy who studied frogs and mice is going to meet his first lion. I see. Theodore, you remember the day you told me you were going into politics? Uh, let me see. Uh... I said you were crazy, that honest men got nowhere. For 30 years, you've been making me eat my own words. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, they're getting ready for the parade. Hail to the chief. Yeah. In another hour, I'll ride down Pennsylvania Avenue for the last time. There will be a new chief. No. There's only one chief. You. You've been more than a great president, Theodore. All over the world, people know you and love you. You stand for America at its best. Whether you realize it or not, you are the greatest living American. At long last, it was here. Theodore Roosevelt, private citizen. There were wonderful evenings with Edith and the children. And then the African big game safari. Afterwards, in Europe, there were more serious matters. I rode horseback with the German Kaiser, prowled through the English countryside with Britain's Minister of Foreign Affairs. I heard the mutterings of a European war and the worried question, what about the United States? In August 1914, all of Europe repeated the question. And in August 1915, part of the answer was given. The great canal locks at Gatun swung open, Bands played, cannon saluted. The Panama Canal was a reality. The Pacific states were 8,000 water miles nearer to New York. The United States were truly united by the cargo ships of peace and the warships of our liberty. When 1917 came, we were ready. Came, Edith. Well, I've been wondering where you disappeared to. What in the world are you doing here on this log? Oh, we were just talking about frogs and growing up to be a naturalist. Somehow we seem to have drifted off into other things. We? Yeah, Bobby and I. Well, Edith, I want you to meet a... Oh. That's strange. He was here only a minute ago. <laughs> or an hour, perhaps. He was a bright little fellow. Another boy, another frog. Oh, it's getting chilly. May I lean on your arm? You'd better. Mm -hmm. Edith, this is May 10th. I know. The day you resign as Assistant Secretary of Navy. Twenty years ago today. Mm -hmm. Now there's another Roosevelt in the same post. Franklin, I think his name is. I wonder. Yes, dear? I was just thinking. So much can happen. Yeah. It's been a wonderful life, hasn't it, Edie? We've seen it all together. From the day of our first quarrel. Children only knew. We did know, Edie. That's what was the matter with us. Even then, we were in love. Theodore. 
Theodore Roosevelt died on January 6, 1919. At first, it was almost impossible for the nation to believe that its famous son had stopped breathing. But he does live on in the fiber of millions of trees which he saved for the generations to come, in the great seaways of the Panama Canal, in a better way of life for all Americans. His key to achievement was summed up in one line. Don't flinch, don't foul, hit the line hard. Roderick Crawford and James Hilton will return in a moment. Uh, we seem to be on a classical plane tonight. First Homer, and now that renowned English man of letters, Samuel Johnson. It was Johnson, you know, who said, we must keep our friendships in constant repair. And at the time he said it, that wasn't easy. A visit to a friend 40 miles away was a day's trip. One letter meant hours with a sheet of paper and a feather quill, and often took weeks to reach its destination. How much easier it is nowadays, especially with all the help we get from the folks who sell Hallmark cards. For instance, right now, there is a gift for you from these fine stores that is just about the best help to friendship I know. It's the Hallmark Date Book, a small, conveniently arranged day-by-day -day calendar of every month in the year. There's space beside each day for names of friends you want to remember on that day. Their birthdays, anniversaries, weddings, graduation, and the like. There are separate pages for names and addresses of all your friends. A good way to keep your Christmas card list. Yes, the Hallmark Date Book and the fine stores that sell Hallmark cards certainly help us all to keep our friendships in constant repair. Ask for your free Hallmark Date Book tomorrow. Here again is James Hilton. I think you'll all agree with me that Broderick Crawford did a splendid job as Theodore Roosevelt tonight. Your portrayal, Broderick, was an excellent reminder of the need there was then, as there is now, for great men to work wholeheartedly for a stronger and better America. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. You know, as Frank Goss just said a few moments ago, there are times when it's hard to put into words just exactly what you want to say. I guess the best practice is to say the sincere and appropriate thing just as your Hallmark cards do. I sincerely enjoyed appearing on the Hallmark Playhouse, and I think the choice of Teddy Roosevelt's life story was a very appropriate one because he left us a heritage of faith and strength and courage that is just as alive in America and Americans today as it was when he lived. Tell me, what have you planned for next week, Mr. Hilton? Next week, we shall have a charming story by one of America's most popular writers, Edna Ferber. It's called Farmer in the Dell and tells of the life of a Middle Western farmer and the problems he has when his children grow up and move away to the big city. And we're happy to welcome as our star, Charles Bickford. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. And our story tonight was adapted by Leonard Sinclair. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Roderick Crawford may currently be seen with Judy Holliday and William Holden in the Columbia picture Born Yesterday. The part of Edith tonight was played by Lorene Tuttle. Secretary Long was Ted Osborne. The part of Tom was played by Tom Tully. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at this same time when James Hilton returns to present Charles Bickford in Edna Ferber's The Farmer in the Dell. And the week following, James Ronald's Old Soldiers Never Die, starring Raymond Massey. And the week after that, Kurt Carroll's The Golden Herd on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri. Stay tuned for the lineup. When you ride Kansas City public service cars and buses, you save yourself all driving and parking worries. But that's not all. You save your auto, and you save money, too. Time now, 9 o'clock. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. <laughs> I hope this won't 
take long, Lieutenant. I, I've got to get back to my milk wagon. It won't take my long, horse. Mr. Mayo. Now, let's sit here. Yeah, I just think if I hadn't been delivering milk, I wouldn't have seen this fellow run out of the alley. Just so you can identify him. Oh, I can do that. I'd know him any place. By the way, he scared Olga. Olga? My horse.